<laughs> Dit weekende was er in de Liverpoolse Cathedral een indrukwekkende rouwdienst. Ten nagedachtenis van de 95 omgekomen supporters. Dit weekende speelde het nog steeds zwaar aangeslagen elftal ook weer een wedstrijd. Dat gebeurde in Glasgow, ten bate van het fonds voor de nabestaanden en de slachtoffers van de voetbalramp. Na deze wedstrijd maakte de voorzitter van de Engelse voetbalclub Liverpool bekend dat aanstaande zondag de voetbalwedstrijd tegen Nottingham Forest opnieuw zal worden gespeeld. De rampwedstrijd van Sheffield werd 15 april na zes minuten gestaakt. Vandaag zond de BBC een verslag uit dat gemaakt werd door de ex-international en de ex-Liverpool speler Greg Johnston. Aan het einde van het vorige voetbalseizoen nam hij na acht jaar afscheid van Liverpool en ging hij naar zijn familie in Australië. En daar werkt hij nu als verslaggever bij de televisie. Greg Johnston reisde na het horen van de ramp onmiddellijk naar Engeland en was de afgelopen twee weken bij zijn ex-teamgenoten en zijn ex-supporters. In zijn reportage praten de spelers voor de eerste keer over hun gevoelens in de afgelopen weken en hoe zij hun supporters nu met hele andere ogen bekijken. The center circle at Anfield, the home of Liverpool Football Club. But to many people, this has become the center of the world. It's been a shrine, it's been a cathedral. But above all else, it's been a huge source of comfort to a city in its very darkest hour. I've been shocked and saddened by some of the things said and written since that awful day at Hillsborough. But few outsiders would realize the full impact that this tragedy has had upon this great city and its people. A horrified worldwide audience witnessed these sickening scenes. Trisha Longhorn was in that crush. Fortunately, she survived. The guy in front of me must have been really suffering himself. But he said to me, just keep your head up there. He said, just keep breathing. I went there as a football supporter, a fanatic. And I just remember when I got on the pitch eventually, I thought, God, it's just not worth it. That is it with football. And I love, I live for Liverpool Football Club. And uh, I just thought, uh, you know, it's just not worth it. You know, I almost died in there. Bruce Grobbler, the Liverpool goalkeeper, was only yards away. I turned around and I looked at it toward the gate, the small gate. Um, and a young lad was shouting and screaming, Bruce, try and get the gate open. And I said, I can't, but the policeman should do it. And I shouted at the policeman to open the gate, which he looked at the problem and he opened the gate. And that was when the first start of people started spilling off onto the pitch. You, you say you heard screaming. What sort of screams was it? Just help, uh, screams for help. Um, it wasn't any uh, screams for, for Liverpool Football Club. It was screams of... Uh, uh, fright. None of the players now sitting in the dressing room realise the scale of the tragedy till a full two hours later. I just burst into tears. I was, I was emotional at that point. You know, I was, I was bad for two days, very bad. I just couldn't stop myself, couldn't stop myself crying, and I was in a bad way. Uh, since then, I haven't been too bad, and, and the days since. But some people feel it late. Some people, I, I felt it early. Morning on Merseyside, and numbed by the reality of more than 90 dead people instinctively made a pilgrimage to Anfield to pay their respects. Later that evening, even more gathered at their other place of worship. You walk down the streets and you see people's chins on the ground, eyes red raw. But when, you, when you're born and bred in Liverpool, like, you know, um, you're part of the place. It seems to have um, ripped apart, you know, ripped, ripped the city apart. As if the grief in the city was not enough. Headlines like these made Scousers the world over wince in disbelief. Disgusting, really. Um, I mean, what they've, what they've created on Merseyside now is a, is a hate relationship for the press. Not necessarily all the papers, just maybe one or two, one in especially the Sun, and um, for its attitude towards uh, those people who they thought had been doing things. I mean, it didn't happen. I was there. It just didn't happen. There was that much total confusion. It just didn't happen. For me, Harold, or Big H, as he is known, echoes the real spirit of Merseyside. This close friend of the players proved to be a huge boost to morale. He assumed the emergency role as Anfield's tea lady to the players and families of the bereaved alike. However, he had this message for those newspaper editors. There's a couple of newspapers I don't even buy now, which are dead read. And uh, when I go in the shops in the morning, they're, 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 they're stacked up, so no, no one's buying them. And I've got no respect for the people that wrote all that. He should have went to the game and had a look at Liverpool supporters, what they would be done that day. It was just absolutely 
it was tremendous. And all I've, I've got for the, the likes of the people who helped that day is admiration. I first saw this picture in an Australian newspaper. It brought me to tears as I recognised two familiar Anfield faces I assumed dead. It was the happiest moment of my life seeing them both in the players' lounge, comforting the families of the bereaved. People come up to you now on the street and say you should be dead. Yeah. What do you say to them? They're alive. They can't wait for the next match. That's all we keep saying. The crossing was unbelievable and your throat was stuck. The wire against your throat and that's... The breathing was, you know, gradually going down and that's the last thing I remember saying was, this is it, I'm dying. Did you feel the pain? No, there no. was no pain. No pain? No. It looked, the pictures looked painful. But they were It's just... You stopped breathing, you just, you wanted to take a deep breath and all you could take was just a little breath and they were going out of you. A lads from the outside saying, started to hit me, asked me to keep awake, tell me to keep breathing. Did you know who it was? No, just, just somebody from Liverpool, Scouse accent. The normally reticent Kenny Dalgleish spoke about the people of his adopted city. You haven't come from here to say no, have I? Twelve years I've been here and I thought it was, I was quite close to the people. I thought I could relate to, to what the club meant to, to the, the, the fans. I knew it meant an awful, awful lot, but I never even thought it meant as much now, as much as what well, I've, I've learned over the past ten days. I've only learned that really through up the club and walking through having my, my little girl and my little boy. And it really moved me and I think it's moved everyone. And I think, really, the city has had its critics in the past, but I think there's no one can criticise this city for the way they behaved in Hillsborough. And I think they've been an absolute tribute to, to Liverpool. Dalgleish's voice was responsible for waking at least one patient out of coma. As Gary Kozakuri wasn't conscious for their visit, the boss and his players left a tape at his bedside. Hi, Koz, it's Ken Dalgleish here. Glad to come to see you the other day there and you missed us. So let's make sure you get yourself up on your feet, get yourself up and about, and get yourself up to Anfield and give us a look in. Hello, Cousy. It's John Aldridge here. Uh, know you've opened your eyes and, and, you, and you, you're getting better every day. So come on, get down here and get walking and get your boots on and have a game with the lads. All the best. Cosa is now awake and on the men. Our thoughts are with those still in intensive care, while John Barnes reflects the sentiments of all the players. People are waking up out of comas and, and you know, saying, oh, is this brilliant that you've come to see us kind of thing, you know? And, and so consequently that lifted us. Everyone's talking about how we're lifting them, but they really have lifted us. And even meeting the families. Mm. You know, you meet uh, wives who've their husbands and, and lost their kids, and, and they've been so glad to see you. You know, they've mm. been at the ground. A woman, keeps, she comes to the ground, she's the only place she's happy. She's been there every day last week. Had he seen the picture of Lisa and Debbie in the newspapers? I had heard, I know you hadn't, but I, I had heard that, that they were okay before. But as you say about the picture, you would have thought that they, those are the two who would be dead. And I think that knowing them really brought it home to me anyway. You know, uh, you talk about taking people for granted. We've all done it, you know. And uh, I know that I won't be doing it anymore because after seeing that, if I, could, if I ever see those girls out, and I'm sure I will, because they'll be back outside Anfield, I'm sure I'm just going to have to hug them. Because it, it's strange that we all stop and sign autographs and... But those girls were there, and they nearly died for us. We've all learned a whole lot of lessons over the past few weeks. I'm just sorry that, as a footballer, I never really realised the huge stakes that I was playing for. I've admired this city and the way that it's accepted its loss with dignity. And as I leave, I leave in the confidence that the team, its supporters, and the city can rebuild and go on to even greater glories. And when I do get home, I'll tell my mates a different story to the one they may have read about. If you had a dream come true, what would your dream be now? To win the FA Cup. To never be defeated. Tot zover deze reportage over Liverpool, de spelers en de supporters. 
Televisie vanavond ook over de politieke crisis. Morgen misschien duidelijkheid. Graag tot volgende week. Goedenavond.